Welcome to r slash pro revenge the movie best of 2021 in this epic two hour plus episode I'm going to be showing you the very best revenge stories from the entirety of 2021 There'll be stories from r slash pro revenge of course, but also nuclear revenge Supernova revenge black hole revenge any revenge you can think of is going to be found in this video So guys without further ado sit back relax and enjoy these epic revenge stories Look at this giant hole you dug for yourself now watch as I bury you in it. Hello Reddit, long time lurker and commenter, first time posting. This occurred back in the late 90s in Australia, so Aussie terms will be used. I was in my third and final year at uni, studying archaeology. Due to recurring and severe illness in the second semester of my second year, I've been unable to complete several core subjects and had to repeat them. This included an archaeological field school held in the mid-year holidays where you would implement the techniques you had already learned. This field school was compulsory if you wished to enroll in a particular subject, but not everyone studying was headed in that direction. I had successfully completed the previous year's field school, but due to my illness, I was unable to complete the associated course, so I had to retake them both again. This university has a number of campuses dotted around the country, and some overseas. The field school is offered to students on two campuses, the main campus, located north of Capricorn, and one of its offshoots, located even further north of Capricorn. The field schools are held in the area of the main campus, so those participating are required to travel to attend. For some, it's across town, for others, it's several hours in a car. Needless to say, those attending from the sister campus do not do so lightly or cheaply. My lecturer, who we shall call Matt, was a bloody legend. He was a brilliant lecturer, has authored two books, and is still working in the field, albeit at a different university than the one in this story. He knew his stuff. He was easygoing, friendly, he'd sit and share a jug of beer with you on a Friday arvo, and I only ever saw him angry once. Now, this is important for later. Also note that grading went as follows, in descending order. So HD was passed with a high distinction, 85 to 100%. D was passed with distinction, 75 to 84%. C was passed with credit, 65 to 74%. P was just a flat pass, 50 to 64%. PC was passed conceded, 48 to 49%. And N was a fail, under 50%. So then, moving on to the events. Matt and his counterparts at the sister campus have been granted permission to conduct this particular year's field school in a gully adjacent to a historic and protected listed cemetery. This gully actually split the cemetery in two and was used basically as a garbage midden. Due to the nature of the gully, there was only one space permitted for a specified number of dig sites. Groups were to be allocated a site once they arrived on the first day, after they had decided on their members. As I was living on campus and had no car, I knew I'd be unable to arrive at the field school at the specified beginning times. I'd be half an hour late on the Friday and Monday mornings and a full hour late on the weekend. I'd spoken to Matt about this, and as we knew each other quite well and had shared jugs of beer quite often, he agreed that I would not be penalized for arriving late, but that I'd most likely be allocated a group to make up numbers, rather than choose my own. It couldn't be helped, so I agreed. This is also important for later. Friday rolls around. I arrive at the site a half hour late, all good, and I'm introduced to my group. There are four of us. Myself, the only female in the group, but experienced in how the field school is run due to my previous year. Gaza, an older, grizzled male geology student who was taking the course just as a matter of interest. Baza, a young male geology student who, by all other indications, was heading towards a lucrative career in the mining sector. And Daza, another young male geology student, good friends with Baza, also heading towards a lucrative career in the mining sector. If you couldn't tell guys, these names are obviously made up and you'll see why they have to be made up and kept secret as we move on with the story. All three of my counterparts, Baza, Gaza, and Daza, were from the sister campus. So they traveled at some expense to attend. They'd already been allocated a dig site and when introduced, Matt tells them I've got field school experience. So to utilize my knowledge, Baza and Daza smile and nod, giving me a friendly wave. Gaza grunts, but a little later, while surveying our area, we get to chatting. He's a nice enough bloke, just a bit miffed he's been put in a group with a bunch of young idiots, and he was worried he'd be carrying us or keeping us in line. Nah mate, I'm here to get stuff done. 
get the data I need for next semester, and hopefully enjoy myself as much as I had the previous year. Now, let me tell you, Lara Croft and Indiana Jones have royally effed up the perception of the greater public when it comes to archaeology. No, Jurassic Park doesn't count as they're paleontologists dealing with animal remains. Archaeology and archaeologists deal with human remains. A lot of what happens on an archaeological dig is repetitive and monotonous. You survey your area using surveying equipment, sketch and take photos of your allocated site before measuring out your 1 meter by 1 meter dig pit. You take more pictures and sketches of the as yet untouched pit, as well as taking an initial soil sample. You scrape off a spit of earth. This is a layer of predetermined depth, in this case, five centimeters. And once done, you test the pH levels of the soil you've removed, documenting everything that you've scraped up. Yep, more photos and sketches before taking even more photos and sketches of the pit and anything that may be lost in there before scraping off yet another spit. If you hit an object, you remove the soil from around it, but you don't actually remove the object until you are removing the layer of soil from beneath it. It must remain in situ to preserve the data. Boring, I know, but this is all very important for later. Also important to note is soil composition in relation to how deep you can safely dig your pits before extending the boundaries to prevent soil contamination or the walls collapsing. Our dig sites had quite loose, sandy soil, so it was announced that every 50 centimeters down, we would have to extend the sides of the pit by 50 centimeters on each side. It wasn't anticipated that we'd get much beyond one meter down, definitely not further than one and a half meters, so we'd only need to expand once, possibly twice. This was how they had divvied up the entire site to fit us all in. It became very clear that neither Baza or Daza had anticipated how monotonous the next four days were going to be. Both Gaza and I had to repeatedly call them over to assist us with surveying. And when it came to the soil scraping, they were excited at first, but then became bored as we had to yet again record every minute detail. As I was the only one who had thought to bring my camera along, it was one that required actual film, as this was before inexpensive digital cameras, smartphones were at least 10 years away, and I was a Povo Uni student. I was the one responsible for taking photos. This included candid shots of the entire field school, other groups, the lecturers, and our dig sites. Day one of the field school ends, and we all head back to wherever for the night, to kick back, relax, and prepare for another day of toil. The next morning, Saturday, I arrive at the field school one hour late, so at 10 a.m., as per the bus schedule. Seeing as how I'd already had this okayed by Matt, I'm not anticipating any issues with my tardiness. I get to the cemetery and seeing Matt, give him a cheery, morning Matt, all good, yeah? Matt turns though and glowers at me. I mean, if looks could kill, I'd be right at home in that cemetery with all the other dead people. You know how I mentioned earlier how easygoing and laid back Matt is, and that I've only ever seen him angry once before? Well, this was that time. Matt was pacing, teeth grinding, fist clenched. He was fuming. Just get to your group and get to work. Matt practically snarled at me. I'm worried now that he's angry at me for being late, even though we'd previously squared it. I'm nervous and worried because we'd had a really good report in the past, and now I'm thinking that I've done something that's going to make my last semester at uni hell on earth. Have I done something wrong? I know I was late, but, but like I told you before the field school, this was the first bus I could get out here. Like, I'm really sorry if that's a problem. Matt sighs and shook his head. No, OP, it's not you. You've done nothing wrong. I just can't deal with it right now. So just go to your dig site and get on with it. I'll talk to you later. I head to my dig sites and what I find there almost has me in tears. When we packed up the previous day, our pit was one meter by one meter square with a depth of 30 centimeters. I now stand before a one meter by one meter hole in the ground dug down to a depth of approximately three meters. There are mounds of sandy dirt surrounding our pit, and I can see a multitude of objects that have been excavated just sitting there. Other groups are staring at us, but trying to look as though they're not staring. Nobody will speak to us either. Gaza is livid. The dude is almost apoplectic. Baza and Gaza are both looking very pale and like they want to puke. I'm all, whatever the loving F has happened here, who the F did this? It turns out that after everyone had left the site on the Friday night, Baza and Daza, and another mate of theirs in another group, we'll call him Keza, got together and got on the alcohol. It was during this that they decided to continue digging our pit. 
So they broke into the cemetery with a shovel and proceeded to dig down until one of them passed out absolutely trashed at the bottom of a one meter by one meter hole in loose sandy soil. The fact that the dude managed to wake up and make it out of the hole without the entire thing collapsing in on him is a miracle in itself. Matt had been called out to the site at 3 a.m. by the police who'd been called because one of the residents in the area saw something dodgy going on. Needless to say, Baza, Daza, and Keza were all up Poops Creek in a barbed wire canoe with a rusty teaspoon for a paddle. They couldn't leave until they'd sobered up, but had been told that, in no uncertain terms, after the field school finished that day, they were to pack up and F off. Matt and his counterpart would deal with booting them from the archaeological program on the Tuesday, after the field school ended. This left Gaza and I in a foobar situation. Luckily for him, Gaza was able to join the group that Keza had been part of, especially since the group were all from the sister campus. I, on the other hand, was left hanging like an unwanted tampon string out of the gusset of a bikini. There were no other groups that could take me, and besides, something had to be done about the cluster F that was my dig sites. So, Saturday ended up with me trying to document whatever I could, and to keep Baza and Daza out of my hair, I gave them my camera and told them to take photographic documentation of every single piece of evidence that they had dug up. They had to use the scale measurements and a title board that was supposed to identify the item by date, location, spit level, etc. So off they went with a miniature whiteboard, whiteboard marker, scale measurements, and my camera. This kept them occupied for most of the day, as there were in excess of 200 items that they'd unearthed in their drunken dig for buried whatever the F they were looking for. I ended up filling in that hole, wishing with every shovel of soil that Baza and Daza were still passed out drunk at the bottom. But <laughs> such is life. Matt ended up taking me to another group in the observational role, as the members of that group were all from my campus and would be in the same second semester class as me. So then, moving on to the revenge, the moment you've all been waiting for, what happens next? Now, as I previously mentioned, the field school was linked to another class held during the second semester. This class essentially took all of the data and evidence that had been unearthed during the field school and you examined, tested, collated, and then submitted a report based on those findings as your final assessment piece. Seeing as I had only one day's worth of actual data and evidence, I could not submit the field school report as required. As this was a core class and I didn't want to have to retake it for a third year, I approached Matt to talk about how we could rectify this into a situation where I'd be able to pass and continue with my studies. After some discussion, Matt agreed to allow me to do a field school critique using what had happened to me as essentially a how-to on how not to conduct or participate in a field school. I had the data from the first day to use in the class and then the photos and sketches taken by myself and the dodgy brothers, Baza and Daza, of the objects we'd excavated. After developing the film of the field school, I noticed some interesting things. The candid photos I took on the Friday included shots of Baza and Daza not only behaving inappropriately, but interfering with the equipment we were using, and therefore possibly contaminating the data we'd legitimately acquired. They were also shown to be in areas that we weren't allowed to be in, touching things that didn't belong to them, and also damaging ornaments left on some of the historic graves closest to the dig sites. Then, there were the photos that they had taken on the Saturday. They'd apparently decided that, because I wasn't overjoyed by the fact that they completely screwed me over by digging that hole, they'd make the only photographs of the artifacts they'd unearthed unusable by writing inappropriate comments and cursing and slurs towards me on the title boards. One of the ones that has stuck in my head was a large clay slash ceramic clam decoration on which they'd written, Oh, I do love a day beside the seaside with a hairy clam. This was the only photo of the clam that had been taken. When we filled the pits back in, we had to re-enter the artifacts, so I couldn't just take a new picture. Also, over 200 pieces had been unearthed, remember? And Matt had told me to use everything I gathered to write my report. So I did. I used every single photo, including the ones that said I was a blank, not in the friendly way that most Aussies use the term, and that alluded to wishing sexual violence on me. At the end of the semester, I submitted my reports, knowing full well that the best I could hope for was a pass, but that was enough to get me through to my final year. And now for the final section, the fallouts. I found this out from Matt at the beginning of my final year at uni. 
So it turns out that when Matt had booted the Dodgy brothers from the archaeological program, they'd been allowed to continue on with their degree, studying geology, but they were not allowed to have anything to do with archaeology, and they were on very thin ice. When I submitted my reports, and Matt saw the extent of what they had done, kindly documented by themselves on the most part, and just how badly they had screwed me over, Gaza was fine by the way, as the group he'd been moved to had all the appropriate data, and had been able to submit a proper field report, Matt went ballistic. He called a meeting with the deans from both campuses, the Department of Tropical Environments and Societies, the Geology Department, and the Department of Anthropology, Archaeology, and Society, the Archaeology Department, for both campuses. He presented to them my field report, told them about how he'd been teaching me for the past three years, and had it not been for the illness affecting me during my second year, how I would have likely completed my degree by this point. He also spoke about my previous field school, my behavior, and that had I not been forced to withdraw due to my health and based on previous work I'd submitted, I would have likely received a D or even an HD on my work. The fact that I averaged C and D during the time I was ill showed my academic prowess. The fact that the only grade he was able to give me for the report he currently had in his possession was a PC was a blow to my academic record that was wholly undeserved. He said a lot of other things, but the end result was that Baza and Daza were not only expelled from the archaeological program, they were now booted from the geological one as well. Furthermore, they were expelled and black banned or blacklisted from the university itself, which meant they could never re-enroll and any other universities they applied to would be able to see this and the reasons why. Essentially, they were blocked from being able to obtain any university degree in that area and to enroll in any university for a different career, they would have to wade through oceans of bureaucratic red tape and jump through so many hoops they'd make the Duracell bunny jealous. Unfortunately, this experience soured me on archaeology as a career path. Luckily for me though, I was able to pick up a couple of extra courses in history and English and I graduated with a BA with a major in English literature and a minor in history and archaeology. I went back to uni after a gap year and obtained my grad dip in secondary education. And there we go, guys. That is the end of that revenge story. A very long, detailed one. The revenge was definitely good, but to be fair, OP didn't really do anything that they weren't asked, right? I mean, they were asked to submit all the different photos they had, not leave anything out, and just they were asked to submit every single photo they'd taken, literally all 200, not editing them at all, not retaking photos. And yes, they had been, you know, defaced, and there were some insults written by some of the some of the brothers. Baza and Gaza, was it? Baza and Daza, I'm not sure. Someone with a name that rhymes with Azza. Um... And you know what? I think you did the right thing by, by you know, just giving them in as, as they were. What could you have done? You know, if you'd like tried to rub off the, the markings or the words or the hate that was on it, who would you really be helping? Only Bazaar and Dazza. Not yourself, not the project that had already been ruined, by the way, by these drunken idiots. So I think you were well within your rights to just say, you know what? Yes, they've been defaced and yes, I'm getting insulted here, but let's just hand these in as they are. I guess this story shows as well the benefit of, of being a good student in general and having a good rapport with your teacher or your lecturer. I mean, in this case, say you had not been attending lectures or, you know, going to seminars or going to practical days like this and this had happened, I think your teacher, Matt, would be way less likely to be on your side and say to the deans, look, this is very, very out of character. This doesn't normally happen. Clearly, it's not OP's fault. Let's just let, let them redo it and, you know, get a better mark like what happened. And yeah, you did well to to, to graduate with with a with a very good uh, a very good degree so yeah overall well done it is a shame though, that it's kind of like putting you off archaeology because it sounds like you're really into it and a couple idiots digging three meters down because they were absolutely smashed <laughs> it's kind of funny but I, I get why it would annoy you if i'm gonna be honest so um yeah i can't say i've never done anything like stupid like that in my life or when doing some sort of experiment in school not bantered around a bit but this is uni, man, and it's probably like very important for your final grade. So to be digging really far down when you've absolutely smashed on alcohol, I don't know. Honestly, the more I say it, the more funny it gets. Sorry. Revenge of the construction workers. I am a teacher. And when I was younger, I would take summer jobs to supplement my income. One summer, I worked for a bricklayer named Jerry and heard an amazing story. I worked for Jerry in the mid-90s, so the story either happened in the early 90s or in the 80s. Here goes. The setting for the story was a community of small rural towns which had only one brick contractor. Jerry began his career as a bricklayer working for this contractor. A real jerk. Jerk and jerk son, let's call it. Adult working the business with his father. Now they would harass, 
belittle and humiliate all their employees on a regular basis No work was ever good enough and employees were told they weren't worth what they were paid Not only did jerk mistreat his employees But he was equally rude to other subcontractors and to the general contractors who hired him Since he was the only bricklayer in the community. There was literally nothing anyone could do about it Needless to say the turnover rate for the brick business was very high The only person that stuck with jerk and company was jerry Jerry told me that his father had instilled a self-confidence in him that jerry could do anything He set his mind to and that he should not evaluate himself according to what others said But rather by facts Although jerry was belittled by jerk and son as were all other employees Jerry was becoming a very good bricklayer Jerry knew he was good. The jerk knew jerry was good But the jerk didn't know that jerry knew he was good Not only was Jerry a good bricklayer, he was very respectful to the boss who disrespected him. The jerk thought that Jerry was a naive pushover who was buying his head games. That would prove to be a huge mistake on his part. One day, Jerry was doing an exceptionally good job of laying brick. Not only was his craftsmanship amazing, he was laying brick at a high rate of speed so that he was making his boss lots of money. Of course though, Jerk and Son were belittling his work as though he was doing the very opposite. This scenario was being observed by the general contractor of the project after work that day The general contractor asked jerry to stay behind so we could talk to him as did every other construction worker in the community The general contractor hated working with the jerk The general contractor told jerry that he had heard jerk and son belittling him and told him that he disagreed with everything jerk was saying He asked jerry if he'd ever considered going into business for himself Jerry said that he would like to do that someday The contractor then said that he would loan jerry the money to buy a mixer The most expensive piece of equipment needed to start a brick business if jerry would indeed start said business The only hitch was that jerry would need to pay for the mixer whenever he could and that he would subcontract under the general contractor Jerry agreed to those terms and prepared to begin his new venture Jerry respectfully told jerk and son his plans and gave his notice The two mocked jerry ruthlessly and laughed him to scorn the jerk told jerry you'll be back in two months begging to return to your job You'll never make it as a subcontractor Two months later rather than collapsing as the jerk predicted jerry was still in business and going strong One year later jerry's business was booming and a drunk jerk showed up at jerry's house Begging him to come back to work with jerk and son jerry you're the best employee I ever had Jerry replied, well, why didn't you ever tell me that when I was working for you? Jerk couldn't answer the question and Jerry obviously didn't accept the offer for employment Two years after beginning his entrepreneurial adventure Jerry heard that Jerk and Son went out of business Jerry said that he never intended to harm Jerk and Son when he accepted the general contractor's offer He said that looking back on things he realized that he had become Jerk's greatest nightmare I can't say that general contractor intended no harm though Now I thought the most amazing thing about this story was how jerry maintained his self-esteem in spite of all the ridicule I also gained a respect for jerry's father who instilled an unshakable self-confidence in jerry Yeah, op. I completely agree with everything you've just said there I just don't really understand from like a, a businessman's perspective or you know a general employer someone who has a lot of employees who work under him Why would you ever want to be mean to them or be rude to them or tell them they're worse than they are? Surely the point of a manager is to say to your employees, your workers, you're doing a great job. Please keep going. You're really helping me in the business. And that's the reason why you're in this job and why I'm paying you money to do the job because you're good at it. Why would you go the other way and say you're terrible at the job? Surely you're just going to like disincentivize your workers and make them think they're terrible at their job. As a result, then they're either going to leave or just, you know, be less enthusiastic about their work. If I was in a role or if you were an employee at a company, think about this, guys. Surely you'd want your boss to be supportive and say you're really improving. You're doing amazingly. Or in Jerry's case, just just be honest and say, look, you're doing fantastic work. We really are happy that you're working for us. Wouldn't that make you feel better about yourself and, and then work even harder? That's how it would work for me. I don't know about you, but yeah, strange mentality to go with as a boss. Now moving on to our next post. All she had to do was nothing. First of all, some context. I am a professional attorney wrangler for a big legal firm. If you've watched Suits, I'm Donna if she was wound tighter than a child's music box. As a legal admin, I have to keep a tremendous amount of information straight. Every county in every US state has their own court system, their own rules, and their own idiosyncrasies. 
I have five attorneys on my team. Despite the TV shows, it's pretty unusual for a lawyer to have a special secretary all on their own unless they are very important. So five is a solid number. Because of Corona, which has taken over the world last year, a secretary that left in January 2020 has not been replaced yet. And I've been babysitting one of the partners, Bing Lee, in the meantime. It's been a fun learning opportunity, as Bing Lee works for an entirely different region and type of law than the rest of my team. Also, he has a case where a truck exploded, it was empty, which is awesome. Now on to the story. My manager, Lady Catherine, is the worst. You know the type. She plays favorites. Her best loved word is no. She must be involved in every conversation because she's just that important and necessary. We don't get along because I'm a stubborn know-it-all who's been proven right a few too many times. Highlights include forbidding me from using the same resources other admins had access to on her orders, including backup admins when my workload was too big, and then denying my overtime requests. I literally had no way to do my job some days. It's worth noting that the reason Bingley's secretary left was specifically because of Lady Catherine. In fact, four additional admins quit over the year explicitly because of her. Anyway, at this point, I've been working with Bingley for almost a year. It was November 2020 and we'd settled into a pretty good routine. I'd gotten used to filing pleadings in a different state and no longer needed to double check all my work for new ones. Because law still operates in the Stone Ages, a few US states still require hard copy filing. Anything we want the judge to read has to be sent by actual mail on actual paper to arrive in the judge's actual hands. It's a pain. Most states let you file electronically, but whatever. Bingley mostly only has cases in one of the hard copy states. Now, Lady Catherine, in her excessive wisdom, butted in uninvited and instructed me to include a cover letter when mailing a new filing. This confused me, as I'd been filing for almost a year, and no one, including the admin who originally trained me, had ever mentioned a cover letter. Now, I told her this, and she basically told me to suck it up. I called the court admin to make sure I wasn't crazy and that I hadn't ruined a year's worth of filings and the court admin literally laughed and said to please not include a cover letter ever. So I didn't. Imagine my surprise when Lady Catherine called me writing me up for insubordination. Even knowing the court rules and the judge and the court admin explicitly said to not send a dang letter, she was right because she's always right. And I am, and I quote, a disrespectful little POS and I'm tired of you. A warning went into my employee file pending disciplinary measures. The next day, she emailed my team telling them to reduce my score on my yearly review as she knew I'd been rated too highly for what my abilities really were. It felt to me like she was preparing to fire me by creating a history of poor performance. Well, if you're so tired of me, Madam Manager, I can leave. Within a week of looking, I found a new position. Now, here's the issue. I freaking love my team. This is the best work team I've ever been on. We take each other seriously and we genuinely love each other. A lot of times, admins get pushed around because we don't have fancy degrees, but not here. Calling in to quit, I genuinely cried. I cried a lot. I cried to the point that one of the partners, Bennett, asked if I wanted a counter offer. I said no because that wouldn't solve anything, but he asked what I meant by that. I told him. I told him about the write-up. I told him how Lady Catherine was trying to falsify my employee review after it had been submitted. I told him the reason five admins had left. I told him about how I wasn't allowed to even ask for help. At this point, I'd given myself hiccups from weeping. And one of the partners on my team, Gardner, was calling me asking if he and his workload were the reasons I was leaving. So Bennett let me go do other things like day drink and create a shrine out of legal forms. I thought that would be the end of it until a friend in another office, Charlotte, called me asking what the F I was doing. She doesn't have time to train someone into being the new me and I was the only admin she actually trusts in my office. So why was I leaving her all alone? I told her and she told Gardner and together they plotted. First of all, Charlotte is the manager in her office. So she is on equal footing with Lady Catherine. They also report to the same person. Charlotte called that district manager and told him that Lady Catherine was driving admins away and that the most recent quitter, me, was the only person who knows how to do a lot of the work on my teams. 
and my loss was a serious blow. Apparently, this is actually true, which is both heartwarming and terrifying. Meanwhile, Gardner called up a fellow partner and told her that his world would collapse in on itself if I left. He would go to the nearest bridge and jump off it, which would be pretty impressive in a landlocked state. They had to do something. I got a call the next day from Bennett, saying they had a counter offer they were really hoping I'd take. Basically, instead of Lady Catherine, I would report directly to Gardner. Lady Catherine would be forbidden from interfering with me without first asking Gardner for his permission. This solved the issue and I got to stay with my team, so I happily accepted. I thought the debacle was over. The debacle was not over. Unbeknownst to me, after looking at the evidence, exit interviews, emails, memos, Bennett put Lady Catherine on a performance improvement plan and she did not get an end of year bonus or raise. Turns out I'd been absolutely correct. Lady Catherine's behavior and treatment had been the explicit cause that six secretaries quit in less than a year. I got a call last week from Charlotte. I figured she wanted to gossip about co-workers or rant about how a shared client is a big old headache, but it was actually to give me a heads up. Lady Catherine had been stripped of her management duties. Now, I no longer had any contact with her, which was great, but it also meant that I hadn't seen her behavior actually doubling down on the admins unfortunate enough to still be under her thumb. She had missed every single one of the benchmarks on her performance improvement plan. Charlotte had called me to ask my opinion on who should be the new manager, as I know everyone and she was helping cover some things as an outside manager. Now look, I know some of you are thinking, yes, become the manager and fire Lady Catherine, but I'm not a sadist. I want to stay on my team and do what I do best, which is being a cheerfully annoying, respectful little POS. I told her that one of the more senior admins would probably need some guidance, but would be amazing at it. No one has to deal with Lady Catherine anymore. She is now a mere paralegal and not anyone's manager at all. If she just left me alone and not interfered where she wasn't needed, none of this would have happened. All she had to do was nothing. Oh, I really enjoyed that story. Very nice little one. Um, not too much revenge, but just pretty much just putting someone in their place, right? When they deserved it. What is it with managers in this subreddit, by the way? And managers just not respecting their employees who are, you know, at a lower rank than them, but are still humans. And you're still in the same company. And they're still good at their job, man. I, I don't I don't see why managers have to inherently be disrespectful. Obviously, on this subreddit, it's all about revenge. So we're going to see negative people, you know, a lot of the time and people getting revenge on them. But still, something about managers and r slash pro revenge that kind of go hand in hand. I don't really know why, but I, I love the stories. I also really like how, to be fair to OP, she just genuinely wanted to stay in her job with her amazing team. It wasn't a crazy story about how she wanted to, you know, usurp Lady Catherine, steal her job or take her role fire her become the boss of the company nothing silly like that just genuinely someone who was really happy at work until they had to deal with this horrible boss they love everything about it 99 percent of the work is amazing the rest of her team are amazing apart from this one person who the company soon realized was just a massive problem was ruining a lot of people's lives and causing a lot of people to quit even op very close very nearly but yeah just a very simple solution to a very serious problem Get rid of that one person and improve everyone else's lives in a split second. Well done, that company. They framed me, they fired me, and that's how they effed themselves into a divorce, a prison sentence, and a handful of deportations. This is a long one, but if you stick with it until the end, you will learn how I was framed and fired from my job and accidentally set off a chain reaction that led to a staff overhaul with several managers being fired or moved to other restaurants, the general manager being fired and getting a divorce and one of the managers being investigated by the FBI and ultimately arrested as well as several of the workers being deported. So here we go. I used to work at an upscale restaurant owned by a large corporate entity that owns several different restaurant brands. I worked there for about three and a half years before they eventually fired me. But more about that later. First, I want to give an idea of my role there. My role at that job was a little bit of everything. Since the day I started working there, I took it upon myself to learn as much as possible. I was very persistent with management when I wanted to learn a new department. I'd started as a server, but eventually I'd worked my way into different departments and job titles. 
like carryouts, hosting, bartending, bar backing, banquets, catering, and deliveries. My singular goal while working there was to make myself available for as many hours as possible. I was being paid about $12 an hour, though that fluctuated if I was working as a bartender or server and making tips. Eventually, it was noticed by management how I fit best into one of the non-tip positions. I was so good at it that they decided to try me out as an unofficial supervisor over the team that worked in carryout, catering, and deliveries, as those were all one department. I knew this was going to ultimately mean a few less hours since I would only be working one department, so I negotiated with management to increase my pay by about $1.50. Since I was taking on additional responsibilities, they were satisfied with the pay increase. I wasn't trying to get as much money as possible. I just wanted to be able to pay my bills and still have a little money left over for fun. I was living in the highly taxed city of Chicago, which is in the already highly taxed state of Illinois. So it was pretty difficult to make ends meet and still have money left to enjoy my life. I'm a person of simple pleasures and I can enjoy things for long periods of time, so it didn't take much money to be happy. A video game could hold my attention for several months, sometimes even years. I had a family pet that I'd brought with me to Chicago, so that counted as an extra expense. Not long after I started this position as the unofficial supervisor, I got a girlfriend, so I was also going out more often and, of course, spending money on her. With my position and some smart budgeting, I was able to afford all of this. The money wasn't an issue, but management had a high turnover rate, so the incoming managers often didn't know what the department entailed or how important hours were to workers of these departments. Eventually, it was noted that our current general manager was going to be fired and replaced. The incoming general manager was supposed to be some rock star when it came to improving restaurants. We looked up his name and found him as the first search result on Google. But the entry wasn't some glowing review of his work ethic or of his impeccable ability to improve the way a restaurant runs. It was actually a mugshot and a police report filed for repeated domestic abuse. This is important for later. We'll call him Harvey. Shortly after Harvey came in and started making changes, one of our best managers gave her resignation. She refused to work with him and like a freaking oracle, taught us to expect lots of sexual harassment, misogynistic comments, and for him to eventually run this place into the ground. Not long after she left, our general manager began replacing our current managers with handpicked people that he had worked with in the past. Eventually, all but one manager was replaced. That manager was the kitchen manager, we'll call him Fredo. Fredo had been there since I'd started working there. He seemed to be something of a chameleon, as in his values and ethics seemed to change depending on who his boss was. Honestly, I sort of applaud his survival instincts, but I ultimately see him as a suck up and a traitor. Harvey never really replaced the manager for our department, so we ran without a lot of oversight. Unless you count me as the supervisor, we didn't constantly have someone breathing down our necks about how things should be done. Our department had some hiccups here and there, but it still ran really smoothly. Since we did not have our own manager, we often had to radio for a manager to come and help us out on things that needed a manager card for approval. Fredo would always be the one to answer these calls, since the kitchen was closest to our department. Over time, the new team of managers started to see Fredo as the manager of our department as well. However, the hourly team that worked there still saw me as their supervisor. This meant that any time Fredo was trying to make changes that would ultimately hurt us, the team relied on me to mitigate those disasters or to negotiate with Fredo to let us do our jobs the way we'd already proven worked really well. Over several months, Fredo and I would butt heads dozens of times. He and I were constantly arguing about how important hours were to the workers in this department. He had it in his head that we should be living off of tips, like servers. But since most of our orders were carryouts, they came in through Grubhub, and Grubhub doesn't tip. We didn't have a lot of deliveries in a day, and the tips we got from those were maybe 10 bucks if we were lucky, but splitting $10 four ways doesn't add up to a lot. It just showed that Fredo had no clue what he was talking about. Eventually, we had a meeting with our Harvey, Fredo, and all the workers of this department. It was marketed as a chance to voice all our grievances and concerns with the changes they wanted to make with no chance of retaliation. So the workers did exactly that. 
They talked about how Fredo was trying to cut hours even though he isn't our actual manager. When it was brought up that they were attempting to hire someone to be the manager, the team suggested that I take over since I'd already been supervising them and running things smoothly for the last several months. I was also the one that management consulted with when writing schedules, as I had an understanding of the days some workers could and couldn't work depending on their school schedules or family life. I could see at the moment it was suggested that Harvey and Fredo made the decision on the spot that I had to be gotten rid of. Although they didn't say it, I could see the look they gave each other and I instinctively knew that my days at this place were numbered and my job was going to be getting the axe one way or another. They made a bunch of promises to us about not cutting hours. They told us that they would stop sending all but one person home early and only leaving one person to clean everything and close up by themselves, as this wasn't a small department and it was simply too much for one person to do alone while still meeting health and safety standards. They promised that whatever hours we were scheduled for, we would work. We weren't trying to be unreasonable, so we told them that we usually have three or four people scheduled to work our department. They could cut two of them early, but we always needed at least two people here to help close properly. The promise was made that they would always have at least two closers. However, only about a week later, they started sending all but one person home early again every night. One night, they tried to do it while I was scheduled as the closer, and we'd just returned from a massive catering event, and there was an unbelievable amount of cleanup left to do for just one person. When Fredo came in and tried to send everyone except me home, I stepped up and told him that he was consistently breaking the promise he had made to us during that meeting. He looked me square in the face and told me to stop complaining about it, and that if I was going to keep trying to talk to him about him breaking his promises, he could easily find someone who could work my shifts. I quickly realized that this was an assassination attempt on my job. He wanted me to press it further, so I backed off and started cleaning. I ended up having to stay way late and that meant overtime pay anyway. I got a write up for that since we aren't allowed to work overtime without a manager's approval. So when I refused to sign the write up, pointing out that I tried to explain to Fredo that I would not be able to clean up all that stuff alone before my schedule shift ended, I was allowed to leave without signing the write up but only because the HR rep that was present at the time wasn't one of Harvey's cronies. So then, skipping ahead to the day I was fired. It is important to note at this point that I always came into work an hour early. Since we lived in Chicago, food was expensive. However, at our job, we were allowed to have as much free soup and bread as we liked. So I'd come into work one hour early every day so I could have some soup and bread for lunch before my shifts. But on this day, when I walked into the kitchen to get myself some soup, one of the line cooks told me that he had a dish that had been cancelled after he cooked it, and Fredo had told him to give it to someone. He assured me Fredo had already comped it and that it was free to take for whoever wanted it. It just so happened to be my favourite appetiser, so I happily took the free food. Not long after I got to my booth though, both Harvey and Fredo approached me and asked me if I had put in a ticket for that food. I told them that the line cook had given it to me and said it was the cancelled order that Fredo had already comped. Fredo though looked dumbfounded and said he had no idea what I was talking about. So Harvey told me, I think you know that's theft. Go ahead and finish the food and then grab your stuff and go. That's the last meal you'll be having here. I tried to explain to them that I'd been given this food by the line cook, but they refused to listen. So I offered to take them to the kitchen to clear it up with that cook. But by the time I'd gone back to the kitchen with them to talk to the line cook, he'd already gone home for the day. I had no choice but to gather my stuff, say my goodbyes, and head home. On my way out, I told the people working my department that afternoon what had happened, exactly as it happened. They were shocked and angry, but mostly sad to see me go. I decided that on my way out, I would stop by the accounting office and pick up any tips that may have been dropped for me that week, just to make sure I didn't get screwed out of that money. Before heading down, I had the gut feeling to just set my phone to record, and I stuffed it into my pocket with the camera rolling. Although the video was entirely black since it was in my pocket, I did manage to get a pretty muffled recording of Harvey and Fredo's voices through the door, discussing how things had gone as planned and that they'd been trying to get rid of me ever since the meeting with my department. I knocked on the door and they hushed up before opening it. They asked me what I was still doing there and I asked for my tips. 
they gathered what was in the safe for me and handed it over Despite my anger rising at what I just heard, I decided not to burn this bridge just yet. Because perhaps I could freaking nuke it later. I offered a handshake to both managers, thanked them for the opportunity to work there, and left. Making sure to pull my phone out of my pocket and record the front of the restaurant, with the sign showing its name and logo. Working in a restaurant, you learn to always cover your own butt. It's true for most jobs, but something was just telling me I would need this all later. If I was being accused of theft, I wanted to be able to prove it wasn't true if it ever came up in future job interviews, which is exactly what happened and where this all started going nuclear. On the train ride home, I sent some messages and made some posts on some local groups on Facebook saying that I'd just been fired and that I was looking for a job as quickly as possible. By the time I got off at my stop, I'd already set up an interview for later that day. That is very, wow, that's impressive. I was offered the job about five minutes into the interview, but after going over the details, it didn't sound like it was for me, so I turned it down. I interviewed for a few other places and found one that was a dang good fit with a hefty pay increase compared to my previous job and I wouldn't have to deal with customers. It was an auditing job for a logistics company. However, during the interview with the manager of this new job, he mentioned he'd already called my previous place of employment and spoke with the general manager, Harvey. Harvey had told me that I'd been fired for theft. Luckily for me though, the manager I was being interviewed by asked me to tell him more about that, and he was willing to let me pull out my phone and find the recording. I asked him if the voice in the video was the same as the one he'd spoken to on the phone. It was. That was confirmation enough for him that I hadn't made a fake video. He listened to the two managers in the video admit that they had set me up and watched the end when I showed the front of the restaurant, complete, of course, with the logo and name. The manager interviewing me, who will start calling Dean, hired me immediately and asked me to send him the recording. I did. I thought that was the end of it. About seven months later, after settling into this job quite nicely, HR sent out a welcome all our new team members email, which listed all the newest hires, some facts about them, and had pictures of them all. They sent these out every time they hired a round of new people. One of them, Thomas, was a former co-worker who worked with me at the restaurant. We'd worked at the host stand together, so I was pretty glad to see someone I knew and liked coming onto the team. I sought out his desk and went and said hello and asked why he left the restaurant. He, as you can probably guess, hadn't left willingly. He'd been laid off because the company was under investigation. It started as a relatively small matter. The corporate entity that owned the restaurant chain had received an email with an attached video. My video that had been filmed from inside my pocket. That was cause enough for corporate to send someone to investigate internally. Thomas was pretty surprised that I hadn't heard anything about it, since there had been numerous attempts to get in touch with me. As soon as he said that, I logged into my old email I'd used when I first applied for the job at the restaurant. I had at least two dozen emails asking me to come in to discuss my employment and termination. I never replied, I just didn't care enough anymore. I'd also changed my number since then, so they hadn't been able to contact me by phone. Thomas continued, explaining that before corporate had sent someone, Harvey and Fredo had talked with my department and tried to offer them all a small pay increase to spin corporate a story about how I was incompetent at my job and failed to live up to my duties. The day the corporate auditor showed up, there had been a small exodus of people from my old department. They quit on the spot in front of the lady from corporates, let's call her Audrey, and made sure to rat out Harvey and Fredo before leaving. That was strike one for both of them. Strike two came a couple of days after Audrey showed Harvey and Fredo the recording that had kicked all of this off. They denied it vehemently, but there was no mistaking Harvey's voice. It's unique. Not only that, but the video also picked up their voice and mine when we shook hands and had a friendly parting of the ways which was something they'd already bragged about to Audrey, thinking it made them look better that we were able to part on good terms. This wasn't the actual strike two. That came when it was clear they needed to be separated. So Audrey sent Fredo to work at another restaurant owned by our parent company and temporarily demoted Harvey to manager. This tore them apart. They'd once been an inseparable evil team, but the pressure of the investigation must have pushed them over the edge. They ended up at each other's throats, on Facebook, on a public post on the company page. 
The post has since been deleted, but Thomas explained it as the following. Fredo had been pictured in the Facebook post on the restaurant page, and Harvey made a passive aggressive comment about how Fredo shouldn't even be in the picture since he'd been moved to another restaurant due to misconduct. Fredo saw this comment and said something along the lines of, at least when people Google my name, I don't show up as the guy that punched his wife. To which Harvey responded, very funny from the guy who was cheating on his wife with Janet's sister. That's not her real name, but Janet was the girl they appointed to officially supervise my old apartment after they fired me, the unofficial supervisor. Freda replies to that by saying, like you haven't tried with half the waitresses, they've all got stories about you trying to F them. The post was deleted, but not before it had been seen by Audrey the auditor. That was officially strike two. Strike three came the next day when Audrey started interviewing the female waitstaff and bartenders, seeing if any of them could confirm that Harvey had tried to make a move on them. All of them were interviewed separately. Several of them had similar stories. Every girl that confirmed Harvey had made a move on them all said he had offered to be their sugar daddy if they would send nudes or stay after closing to fool around with him. Harvey was fired, but that isn't the worst of it. Audrey the auditor wasn't just some random woman from corporates. She was the old regional manager for this area and had personally hired Harvey's wife as the general manager of another restaurant in the city. So she called up the restaurant Harvey's wife worked at and told Harvey's wife everything she had learned from the female wait staff. We learn later that they had gotten a divorce over him trying to cheat on her after she'd already given him a second chance to change after he had beat her. I don't know what compelled her to give him a second chance after something like that, but she sure didn't give him a third. After firing Harvey, the line cook who had given me the food was interviewed by Audrey. I don't know how it came up, but at some point he let it slip that he was an illegal immigrant. She had his file in her hand with an Illinois ID and social security number on file, so this confused her and she pressed him for more information. It turns out that Fredo had some connections and had his own miniature black market going on where he would have fake social security cards and IDs made for the illegal immigrants he was hiring at reduced wages. It's been going on for at least four years. Needless to say, this is a felony. With the potential PR nightmare that she was likely dealing with, Audrey had no choice but to alert the authorities. Local PD enlisted the help of the FBI since some of the evidence led them beyond the jurisdiction of the local police. Fredo was arrested and quickly gave up the names of the people working that he had sold social security cards and IDs to. I'm not sure if he gave up all of them, but he did name drop about 14 people. And of those 14, at least half were deported by the time Thomas had been let go. One of them was that line cook that had given me the food the day I was fired as well. Oh my God. Just to interject here, it's so obvious that Fredo and Harvey probably blackmailed this line cook into, you know, giving OP some food that he knew Harvey and Fredo were planning to use against him. But they could have easily said something along the lines of, if you don't do as you're told, we're going to revoke your, you know, SSN ID and get you deported. Just disgusting. Thomas went on to explain that it had all started with me being fired, but I never sent that recording to corporates. I'd only sent it to Dean when he hired me. I asked him about it and he told me he had sent it to his wife since she was a lawyer. He wanted to see if I had a case to maybe sue my old job since what they had done was wrong. But he also remembered that when we had first talked about it, I'd said that I'm not the type of person who would try to make millions off an entire company because of the mistakes of two buttholes. But I'd also said that it would be pretty sweet to see them lose their jobs too. So his wife had been the one that sent it to the legal team at the corporate HQ of my old restaurant job. My boss showed it to his wife who forwarded it to the real head honchos of my old job. They were both just trying to get two scumbags fired for what they did to me, but ended up pulling a thread so long that it didn't end until there were sexual harassment accusations, revelations about managers cheating on their wives with girls related to people they'd place in positions of authority, a divorce, mass layoffs pending investigations, a staff overhaul, an FBI investigation into what could be considered black market dealings of falsified government issued documents, and at least a half a dozen deportations and probably as many as 14. Now, I don't know if this counts as nuclear revenge as I didn't actively pursue it, but Thomas ended up showing me that even if it wasn't revenge, it was definitely nuclear and the crater it had left was massive. 
And there we go. That is the end of that spectacular story. If you're still watching right now, guys, and, and you stuck around to hear the entirety of that story, you're a legend. Um, it was a good one, though, wasn't it? I mean, come on. I kind of get what OP is saying, though. Is it revenge? Yes, it's definitely nuclear because the fallout was incredible. People getting deported. These two people, you know, ended up with divorces. Loads of legal battles. It's pretty incredible scenes. Was it revenge, though? I would say it's probably more like r slash nuclear justice because justice was served. But yeah, as you say, you didn't really go out and, and, you know, go for these people's heads. You just happened to be recording an unlawful conversation that occurred. And there's nothing wrong with that. And ultimately, you use that to, to, to get a new job because if you hadn't had that recording, as you say, as you your new boss was saying, well, I asked your old boss how you were and they said this about you. If you didn't have that recording to back yourself up and say, you know what, that is actually absolute bull and I have the recording to prove that, then you would have been in a terrible position. So you were well within your rights to record that conversation is what I'm trying to say. Is it revenge though? I don't know. You kind of got fortunate, I guess, that it got into the right people's hands. Your boss's wife is a lawyer and she did the right thing. And obviously the adjudicator that came in did an amazing job to really work out what was exactly going wrong with this company and how illegal all the proceedings were. And the fallout, as I said, was incredible. So although it wasn't your revenge, it was probably revenge as a whole and completely deserved. It's just like, it's crazy to me that these sort of things don't get found out quickly or, or it takes the firing of loads of different people for this sort of stuff to actually get, you know, publicized, be able to find out about it. It just should happen more easily, I think. It shouldn't take people losing their jobs and having to secretly record on their cameras to uncover that this sort of illegal activity is going on in successful companies, in my opinion. Officer gets a taste of his own medicine and then some. Honestly, I'm not even sure if I'm posting this in the correct thread or not. I'm rather new to Reddit. This happened some time ago now, but after sharing this story with a friend, he told me of this site and begged me to post it. I won't be getting too specific in case there is some unforeseen blowback, but here it is. A bit of backstory, first off. My wife inherited a house and land and begged me to move there. It was somewhere I knew wouldn't have anything in either of my fields for employment, physical security specialist and force on force analytics and planning, but she got a job offer in her field, wildlife management, at a salary that matched what we were currently making combined, along with an employment contract, which is rare in the US, control of her own team and insanely good benefits. Since we have no children and I am the adaptable type and I could see this meant a lot to her, I agreed. We put our house up for sale and we moved there, sight unseen. While I'm used to and even fond of it now, this place was the land that time forgot, literally horse and buggy country. And it quickly became clear that for a while at least, she would have to be sole income while I brought our new property into the modern era. The house literally had no plumbing. There was an outhouse and a manual well pump outside. We decided to buy a used house trailer, place it on the southernmost point of the property and live in it while I worked on the house. Now I am not from this area and the culture shock was intense. My wife though had family from there and would spend a few summers as a child with relatives. So she understood the people better than me and being the same height and skin tone, she was quickly accepted. Meanwhile, standing eight inches minimum above everyone else and being so white I show up from outer space, I had a bit of a harder time, but I managed to make some friends eventually. After some time getting everything updated, we came in way under budget since I decided to learn the skills and do all the work myself. It quickly became clear that while our immediate area was lovely, with good people and trusting neighbors, the surrounding counties had developed a meth pill problem. And with all the industries being strict on drug testing once heroin came onto the scene, people were starting to make their way to our area for break-ins, carjackings, and even a few cases of kidnapping for ransom. A couple senior citizens just outside of town were broken into and beaten, then shot to death just for maybe $300 worth of jewelry, a couple old guns, and their pain meds. Seeing a need in my community, I used the leftover money we had, and I bought land in BFE deemed unfit for development, at a steal. Soil lead levels were too high for housing, farming, and too remote for commercial, and after getting the permits and certifications, and almost a year of doing all the building and earthworks myself, while working a part-time hospital security job a county over, I started a security, self-home defense, and firearms training company. 
I created local jobs in the nearby counties by training armed guards beyond state standards, helped people develop a neighborhood watch program, offered neighborhood security patrols at cost, made sure local shops got cameras and had plans and training in place in case of a robbery, and worked with individual households to develop their own home defense strategies, along with offering concealed carry training, advanced firearm training, OC spray, trauma, and first aid training, amongst other things. Somehow, without meaning to, I managed to wedge myself into a unique position where I not only trained everyday people, but I got certified to be the guy that all police agencies in the region send their officers to for state recertification and further training. It turns out that before I came along, they had to send their officers almost six hours north to a state facility, which meant they also had to pay for a hotel room for anyone that went up there, as well as two meals and mileage if they didn't drive a squad car. Not to mention that the tactics tour didn't always translate well to our area. I offered to do it for a bit less, and given my location, no hotels or anything else were needed. For the first time in my life, I feel like my work really matters, that I'm making a positive difference for real people, and I look forward to going into my job. In my line of work, I've ended up knowing a lot of the police in my area pretty well, and I can say that I even consider a few of them to be friends. The departments I work with get quite a few officers who are new or transfers from other areas as this region of my state has a pretty median average pay grade and a lot of officers use it as a stepping stone to get to bigger paying areas or to get their first bit of experience and then head to another state. Now, the ones who have made a life here and decided to stay learned a long time ago that the locals here don't take anything that isn't fair lightly. The people here demand justice come hell or high water. In the past, corrupt officers have been hanged or beaten to death when the courts failed the citizens and didn't punish these officers for doing something heinous. For instance, one shot an unarmed 12-year-old and another let a drunk or drugged man die moaning in a cell after a canine unit literally ripped open his abdomen and was heard laughing and joking about it. Both essentially got a long paid vacation and then went right back to work until someone caught up with them. Wow. Even one former judge who got a slap on the wrist after being convicted of molesting three children went missing and was later found bound to a tree and was apparently set on fire while still alive. So the officers tend to do a really good job of weeding out the bad apples and reminding newcomers that they are there to help people and protect people, not harm or bully them, which in my experience is not the case with all or even most officers in places I've lived before. All right, then that is all the backstory out of the way. Now we get to the juicy bits on to the story. I was doing an armed guard gig during a night shift, filling in for one of my employees who had a family emergency mid shift when a police car spotted me on perimeter check and pulled into the lot to see who I was. I wasn't wearing a uniform and the place I was guarding receives a lot of raw metals that they then melt into various alloys to be shipped off for use. It's a crackhead's dream looting spot with the way scrap prices can be for some of the materials there. After figuring out it was me, they decided to sit and BS for a bit. While talking with these officers, I listened to them share about a new hire who transferred from a larger city and they just know he's going to cause trouble with the locals. They mention how he has a I know better than you attitude and thinks that the piece of metal on his chest means that he is the law. Apparently, he'd already raised a bit of a stink because he writes citations for things that no other officer in the department has driving with one hand, burnt out fog lights, plastic being taped over a broken back window in a car, headlights not on in the middle of the day and it's raining, that sort of stuff. He even tried to give a guy a DUI even though he was sitting in the car on blocks in his driveway and the car had no rear axle. Apparently, he speaks aggressively to anyone who dare interact with him if they aren't a police officer and overall just acts like a power tripping douche nozzle. The other officers have noticed that the locals have changed their demeanor towards them and seem more distrusting since this guy started and they were genuinely worried that he would turn everyone against them. In the words of one of these officers, with everything in the news these days and the whole nation already being distrusting of us, I hope we can find something to set this idiot straight before he ruins the rep we work so hard to keep here. I like that people here will just come up and talk to me. 
It's the main reason I stayed here. We brainstormed for a while about how to get through to Officer Douche and make him change his ways or career, but eventually came up with nothing legal and had to go back to doing our respective jobs like adults. Two weeks after having this chat and hearing similar things from other officers I know, I get my first interaction with Officer Douche. I don't advertise my business on my work vehicle and it is completely unremarkable. But all the officers I know can spot it somehow. So I've gotten into the habit of waving any time I pass a squad car. On my way to speak with a prospective client about a consultation for their home defense plan, this butt hat pulled me over for waving at him when we passed each other on a two lane highway. He slammed his brakes on, whipped around in the middle of the road, and came flying up behind me, so close I couldn't even see his headlights with flashing lights on and sirens blaring. After enduring his frankly insulting lines of questioning with his hand on his pistol grip about why I felt the need to carry a gun, in my state, it is required by law that anyone with a license has to inform the officer and him sharing his doubts that 99% of people probably wouldn't even know how or be able to use it, the idiot wrote me a citation for reckless operation of a vehicle, stating that he was justified in doing so because he saw me remove my hand from the wheel. Trying to be diplomatic, I said, I just figured that you would appreciate a friendly gesture from someone today. I know I like when someone gives me a friendly wave. This absolute insult to humanity blows his freaking gasket though. Gets in my face yelling at me and threatening to haul your smart butt downtown and see how friendly you are when you're hooked up in the back of my car. He said that if he felt like it, he could cost you more in impound fees and lost wages than you would make in a month. At this point, he has no clue what I do or where I work. Then he asked me what I thought about that. At this point, I have an internal battle with myself, wanting to slam him to the ground and beat his skull open on the asphalt to see exactly how empty it was inside. But saner thoughts prevail, and I simply handed him my lawyer's business card and stated that any further interactions we had would have to go through her. He looked at the card, called me a swear word, and told me to get out of his sight. Once I got moving in my car, I realized exactly how angry he had made me. I have spent years learning to keep my emotions to a minimum since it could cost someone dearly in my line of work, and this idiot was able to boil my blood in just a few minutes. He wasn't a big guy, even for the area, and he didn't carry himself like someone who was confident in their skills. Being that aggressive and having his hand on his pistol grip for most of our interaction, though, spoke volumes as to what kind of person this idiot was. What would happen if he pulled over someone who didn't have my level of control and acted like that or worse? I decided that the officers I had talked to were definitely not exaggerating, and this idiot was going to end up getting himself or someone else killed or hurt, and something needed to be done about it. First, I went to court and showed my dash cam video, which got my citation dismissed. I took the rest of the audio and video to the sheriff of the county he works for and showed it to him. Then we had a long conversation. He agreed with my assessment of this guy, but said that he couldn't really do much but reprimand for it and admitted that he would love to just toss him out on his butt. However, he knew that the union would fight to prevent that and at best, he would only be gone a few days to get some training that would most likely go entirely ignored. He even cautioned me against filing against him because he figured the guy was the type to take it personally and he didn't want to see anything bad happen to me. He promised he would do what he could to get rid of the idiot, but in most ways, his hands were tied. I could tell he hoped that guy would just move on and become someone else's problem when his two years were up. I couldn't help thinking that if he's causing this kind of trouble already, it's only a matter of time before someone around here loses it on this douche and swings at him. That even though this idiot deserves to eat his own teeth at least, some poor guy will end up with his life ruined or worse. All because Officer Douche has a badge and likes to wag his pee-pee around. Feeling as though there was nothing more I could do, I went about my business as usual the next couple of days. Then, guess who came through my door to schedule with me for their recertification? Officer Douche didn't know me from Adam and just swaggered around like he owned the place and started complaining about this being a waste of my time and a bunch of bureaucratic BS. I had a real Kodak moment when I reminded him of our last interaction. He tried to excuse it as just being by the book 
and claimed that my hands were tied when it came to the citation and he only acted that way because i had a firearm and he was nervous about that gun so i needed to assert my authority in the situation by now i had a large portion of people that live in my area coming through for training and most of them carry daily this idiot just confirmed my fears to me and i was gonna do what only i could to lay those fears to rest Q r slash pro revenge mode already forming a plan in my head at this point I told him that I understood completely and that I operate that way as well Not even processing how that could affect him The idiot seemed glad to hear that and we sat down to get his paperwork started The whole time we're doing this he's bragging and talking about how good a shot he is And that he looks forward to the day someone wants to f around and find out with me Hearing that this was what he thinks made me both sick and angry. Yes, I carry a gun for self-defense, but I hope that I never have to use it. I spent years learning other techniques to lessen that chance after having to draw it once and built a career teaching others what I've learned. After getting all the paperwork sorted and scheduling a time and date, he asked if he could use my range to get some practice shots in. I even waived my range fee just to see this guy shoot. After going over the range rules, I ran him out at target at 10 yards and signaled the lane hot. He fired all 17 rounds of his mag at a rapid pace and only managed to hit five on the target, only one of which was sent a mass. He repeated this four more times at varying distances and his best score ended up being at five yards out with only 10 shots on target of which four were sent a mass. I suggested he slow up his cadence a bit and asked if he wanted my advice. He told me that he's forgot more than you ever know and shut your mouth. So I did. Then he proceeded to run it out to 10 yards and shoot one at a time at a slow pace I usually only see from first timers and he didn't get a single hit center mass. After seeing the 13 year old girl a few lanes down from him load up and absolutely drill headshots at 15 yards with my range master instructing her, he made some excuse about needing his sights adjusted. Then he packed up and the brainless idiot left, thinking we were all buddy buddy a few minutes later. And just so everyone is clear, this is the sort of target that OP is referencing. I believe that center mass might be the big ring, everything inside it, you know, from the 7, 8, 9 and the X in the middle. So if this guy was missing all those shots, that is um, pretty embarrassing. The state certifications are a bit simple. So when I started doing this, I met with local union lawyers, training officers, and some reps from my area, and we came up with a standard that surpasses the minimum state requirements, which they in turn use to negotiate better benefits, so everyone wins. The standards that we decided on not only test for accuracy, but they also introduce a bit of real world problems that the officers have to contend with. The first is done in full duty gear with both hands on the gun at 10 yards. After running 25 yards within two minutes, you have to be able to draw your gun from crouch cover, fire 10 rounds, reload a magazine loaded by me with a false round randomly placed into it to cause a malfunction, clear that malfunction and get 10 more rounds on target from standing cover. The second is the same drill in reverse, but done with only one hand on the gun and in under three minutes. In both of these drills, 15 of the 20 shots must be within the eight ring of the target and all rounds must hit the target. And the third is a dot torture drill that must be cleared at 90% within 10 minutes and you have three attempts at it. It doesn't sound too tough if you're an avid shooter, but trust me, under pressure, with your job in the balance, it can be rough. See, the policy around here is that the county pays for your first test. And if an officer fails to recertify, then they either choose two weeks unpaid leave or sit at the office and do paperwork at reduced pay for those two weeks, then they have to pay out of pocket to try again. Of course, it's encouraged that they come to me for help, but being that I'm not a charity, some choose to practice on their own, which is fine. If they fail a second time, the sheriff can cut them loose without any issues from the union, and the officer has to wait one year to even be considered for rehire, or relocate to a different area that doesn't have these standards or the sheriff orders them to come to my training and i work with them until we know they will pass after that second failure the officer's job lies entirely in the hands of their boss 
Being that these tests are a bit tasking for most shooters, and even though I log way more range time than any officer I know, it does help when you own the range, and can still occasionally fail the dot torture drill, I will show mercy for most of them, if they seem like a decent person, who you know is just out of practice, or nervous, and not be a butt when it comes to scoring, if they're close to failing. That would entail counting line breaks as hits when I don't have to, or forgetting to hit the stopwatch button if their cadence is just a second or two slow. But I decided the moment Officer Douche signed the papers that there would be no such mercy for this idiot. I fully expected for him to burn through ammo practicing at home after his last performance. And while I doubted anything was actually wrong with his sights, I wasn't willing to risk being wrong there when I had such a golden opportunity to do some true community service. I even bought a new set of digital calipers, deciding that if he was so much as one tenth of an inch off on any shot placements at the line, I would mark them as a miss and prove I was just going by the book. My mind was made up that since I couldn't get this guy off the force completely, I would go completely by the book and at least get him off of any that were close to the people around me and he would have to perform like an absolute pro to avoid that. The day finally comes where he is to test and he shows up wearing shorts and a tap out t-shirt with only his gun and duty belt emptied of everything else. No vest, no range bag, no radio, no eye or ear protection, no cuffs, OC spray or taser, not a dang thing that he knew he was supposed to have. After pointing out these issues, he huffs and says, I brought everything that's important. Let's just get this rubbish over with. Mind you, I could have failed him right there and then for non-compliance. I had a copy of his signature on the paperwork stating he owned all required gear and would bring it with him for the test and that he'd be dressed to list his standards on testing day. But that just wouldn't have been satisfying enough for me. I wanted to make absolutely sure that anyone who looked into this would see that he himself was the failure. That this loud mouth bolstering pee stain wasn't fit to the standards of his peers and his mother should have swallowed him 25 years ago and done society a favor. Not that he failed due to circumstantial or bureaucratic BS beyond his control. So I let the clothing slide and loaned him some rental safety gear, which he complained about wearing, but eventually put on. After getting it all sorted and noting all of this in his chart, I let him take his test. And dang it, am I glad that I did. If he hadn't made me see him for the feated POS he is, I would have felt sad for him. As it stands, I worried I may develop muscle issues from holding back my grin. He failed the first test immediately due to sheer ineptitude. When the buzzer sounded, first he tripped over his own feet and ate the ground face first, full scorpion. Then, after getting up and continuing while drawing from crouch, he somehow managed to catch his front sights or barrel on his holster opening and sent his gun tumbling through the dirt. Then he fell over when he tried to lean over to get it. Losing control of the firearm is an instant test stop, so I sounded the buzzer. Holding back laughter and putting on my plate carrier instead of just a level 3 vest in case the fool fired a random round my way, I gave him a second chance even though I already had what I needed. Again, this was mostly because I wanted to have irrefutable proof he failed on his skills and not on accidental circumstances. While he managed to keep hold of it this time, he struggled to clear the misfire, costing him too much time for his slow cadence earlier, and only two shots were in the eight circle and four completely missed the targets. For the first time ever for me, someone had failed the first test on all three metrics. I've had people come to me for the first time they held a gun or with a legitimate fear of guns who could outperform this sorry excuse of an arrogant man. After listening to him try to make excuses, complain, demand, and then beg for me to give him another chance, I told him that I couldn't and he'd failed. That my report was getting sent in and he would have to talk to his training officer and we could go from there. He exploded in anger and started calling me anything he could think of claiming I was only doing this because of the ticket he gave me, part of why I wanted so much proof. And he was cursing me in some honestly creative ways while slamming his fist into my wall like a petulant tween and telling me that he was going to make sure you regret all of this while pointing at me and my staff in the other room. By now, a couple of my regulars, my range master and the local brass goblin have all made it over to watch through the window and listen to the exchange. 
knowing I have him on camera with audio punching a hole in my wall and the eye of witnesses, a new thought came to me when I heard him say all this. And I decided to steer him just the way I wanted him to go. All I had to do was ask if what he said was a threat. And the fool responded with, you bet your freaking butt it is. And to my surprise, he reached out to give me a shove. I sidestepped him and he stumbled past, which annoyed him even further. I told him then and there to get the F off my property and that you're not welcome back. I looked this sack of poop straight in the eye and informed him that he just sealed his fate since now you'd have to beg to be sent to the other facility and I'm going to make certain my report recommends you never work as an officer again. And should they ignore my advice, I'd be raising my prices to better reflect the training they get here. He then decided to spit at me and swing a punch this time. Not one to miss an opportunity and easily outweighing him by 50 to 60 pounds. I raised my guard and the moment his arm made contact with mine, I used his momentum and my muscle to send him over my shoulder and directly into the ground with all I could muster. I channeled my ancestors and the ancient gods of their homeland into that throw, fully intending to leave a wily coyote-esque crater in my floor. Rolling him to his back and sitting atop him in full mount position, I watched a wannabe badass try to remember how to breathe after meeting the ground that hard and then immediately crying like a female dog begging for his life when he looked past me to see my range master, who was a 310 pound, six foot six, tatted up retired marine turned bodybuilder with our less lethal training shotgun. The gun is bright green, kind of unmissable as less lethal, in one hand, leveled at the officer. Oh, and he had his phone in the other hand, already talking to the idiot's boss. Apparently, my range master had been watching everything from his office on the security feed. And when Officer Douche started punching the walls, my boy immediately picked up the phone and called the sheriff, grabbing the shotgun on his way out the door to us. When all was said and done, I got to watch him get hauled off my property by his boss in cuffs and read his rights since yes i will be pressing charges he assaulted me threatened me and my employees and damaged my property and i had all the evidence i need to prove it later when i asked my range master why he'd brought the gun into play since the guy wasn't really a threat he reluctantly told me he'd brought it for me apparently in all the time we'd known each other he'd never seen me actually come unglued like that he said boss you are the kindest and quietest man i know and in my experience when a man like you gets that angry even the devil himself would pee his pants to get away he admitted that his plan was to nail me with a beanbag or two if he needed and try to turn my attention to him i'm not gonna lie i wasn't happy to know i made my friend feel that way but it did feel good in an odd way to have a certified badass like this guy feel like he needed that tool to stand against me I actually gave the man a raise for his honesty and willingness to protect others, no matter the cost to himself. After all, that's a rare quality nowadays, and it should be rewarded. And to this day, I refuse to spar with him, because I never want him to 100% know that he could easily take me without it. Despite all the evidence and testimony against him, Officer Douche ended up getting a pretty good plea deal. But he'll never be able to be a police officer or legally own a firearm again. So I consider it a win. Also, his wife filed for divorce for domestic violence while he was awaiting his court date. And thankfully, they had no children together. So it was granted without issue and he has no rights to see her son. He moved away immediately after his hearing. And last I'd heard, he makes minimum wage working at a gas station somewhere up north. And there we go, guys. That is the end of that story. A long one, as I said, but definitely an enjoyable one. And it's good to see some justice going to someone who, let's be realistic, as OP has said multiple times, thinks they are the law, thinks maybe even that they're above the law and just gets away with stuff that, because they're a police officer, they think they're allowed to do. When in reality, come on, that's a total injustice. I think, to be fair, it just shows that if this person had been a nice officer or just a nice person in general, OP would have been way more willing to let them pass the exam. As they even said, you know, if someone's close, or borderline they're gonna they're gonna you know be favorable towards them because there's no point in just failing people randomly yes you want to do things by the book but not to the extent of you know failing people for no real reason when they're just trying to do their job and pass and get their certification and move up in their life but with this person i completely understand why opie was like you know what nah i'm sticking exactly to the rules and i'm letting you fail by yourself 
So there can be absolutely no excuses. You did this to yourself by being annoyed at me for waving at you. Has that ever happened to you guys? Someone's waved at you and you said, ah, oh, that person is too friendly. Let me fail them at something. I doubt it, right? I really do. Yeah, I really don't know why he was sticking to the law that much. I mean, what officer do you know in your life that would see someone wave at them and say, you know what? Their hands off the wheel, baby. I'm going to take them down to Chinatown and put them in prison. No one would do that. So this unnecessary, do your job, but do it properly. Like use some common sense, man. Come on. How my ancestor took down a racist businessman. This is an old story that's been told in my family for as long as I can remember. We're talking my grandfather was told it by his grandfather and so on. Note that this story has had close to 200 years to be embellished and twisted. So take everything with a grain of salt rather than just scream fake. Even if only a fourth of the story is true, it's still a great story. This is the story of my ancestor we'll call John because that's the name I've always been told. John was a black man in America during the time when slavery was dying out. His grandparents having been brought there from africa along with their children john eventually was freed through some means i've heard both that he paid his way out or the state he was in abolished slavery and he was freed that way and he found himself fighting in the civil war because he felt it was the right thing to do during the war he became good friends with a man only known as mitch who supposedly came from money but had joined against his parents wishes because he believed in freedom for all again grain of salt the two of them were in the same regiment and made it through alive though some relatives say mitch lost a leg or an arm in the war fast forward to the end of the war and john and his new wife mary he'd met during the war used the money he'd earned to set up a small shop on the east coast most common city mentioned is boston in a small neighborhood the shop became successful John being a charming man and surprisingly savvy businessman. The neighborhood he'd set it up in quickly grew as the city grew, meaning there were always customers who needed whatever it was he sold. I've heard everything from groceries to workers' tools. They lived happily and had three children together during the time, spending a decade there. When suddenly, presumably accompanied by the roar of thunder and screeches of crows, Mr. Business arrived in town. Mr. Business has apparently been on the wrong side of the war and fought quite hard to keep his slaves, but was also smart enough to sell out other racists when he saw how the tides of the war were rolling, getting by with no losses except his free laborers. This had been the beginning of the end for his once successful plantation farm, as all the workers he could find to replace his slaves had wanted things like pay for their services. Unbelievable, I know. He'd struggled to find loyal workers that didn't charge more than the absolute minimum. And after a series of bad harvests, he'd chosen to pack up, sell his land and head east to find a new source of income. He arrived and began buying up local businesses that seemed profitable and eventually found out about John's successful store. He was more than happy to discuss a fair price for the store until he saw the skin color of the owner. 10 years, not enough time to erase a lifetime of institutionalized racism. He began harassing John to sell his rinky dink store and find a farm to work on. Don't quote me. Offering way below the actual value. And when laughed out of the store, he began trying to sabotage John's business. He got thugs to throw rocks through windows, sabotage deliveries, and just made a general scene in the store. John soldiered on though having grown tragically used to fighting against racism. He also had a lot of friends in the community who helped keep the store floating. At the time, John's oldest son, who was about 13 or 14, found himself getting beaten up heading home at night from his job. Again, the details here are blurry and wound up with a lot of scars that he'd supposedly be stuck with for his entire life. John had had enough and as luck would have it, had an out having been contacted by his old friend Mitch. Mitch was starting up a plantation of his own in the Southwest and needed loyal workers. He'd offered John a foreman position, good pay and a plot of land to live on with his family. This, dear readers, is when the revenge plan begins. John contacted Mr. Business, offering to sell at 75% of what the shop was actually worth. And maybe because his other businesses hadn't worked out, he took it. However, John supplied the contracts and proper solicitor to make things legal. The contract basically said that after the midnight of the date of signing, the shop and everything inside would transfer ownership to Mr. Business. Little did he know that that day up until midnight, the shop was having a massive clearance sale, selling everything at discount prices to a grateful neighborhood. 
When they closed up that night and mailed the keys to Mr. Business, there was little left to sell in the store, if anything. John never found out what happened next, as they left town soon after and never returned. But personally, I'd like to think that Mr. Business arrived with his workers to an empty store with no deliveries coming, screaming and crying in the mud as he realized he'd been outsmarted by a lesser species. John and his family moved to work at Mitch's farm for the rest of their lives. John supposedly passing away in his 60s. Thank you for reading. Again, a lot of this is probably embellished, if not straight up a fairy tale, but my family all treat it as a true story. And I felt it was too good of a story to not share here. And there we go, guys. That is the end of that one. As OP even admits, you know, he doesn't really know how much of it is legit, what actually happened back in the day, or how much of it is just hearsay from, you know, people passing that information and telling stories. But I don't really think that really matters, to be honest. The whole point of it is that it's a wonderful story. A black man getting revenge on a slave owner who wants to continue owning slaves is an amazing thing to hear about. And let's be honest, it doesn't really matter if it didn't exactly happen the way it's said in the story. It's still great, nonetheless. I want to see this Mr. Business put down in the mud, in a grave, because because he's a disgusting human and trying to, you know, take back control of the people that he used to own and all that sort of stuff and moving across the country to make sure he can still own slaves. It's disgusting. What John's done here is great. I think, to be honest, he could have even gone a little bit further and I don't know, like when he's when he's hearing about his own son getting beaten up, that would stir some very horrible emotions inside, I'll be honest. So I'm, I'm surprised, to be fair, that he only went this far and I wouldn't even have blamed him, to be honest, if he went a step further and got violent, to be fair. Now, moving on to our second story. Story. Now, this one actually comes from r slash nuclear revenge. So we're kind of stepping up a little bit here. Steal my meds, enjoy divorce, jail, joblessness, and sleeping in your car. 16 years ago, I made a friend one day on the bus. Up until about a year ago, I considered this guy a member of my family. Let's call this guy Joel. So I keep a crystal bowl on the mantle above my fireplace, full of my medical marijuana. I started noticing that after poker night, my bowl seemed a lot emptier than it should. So I set up a camera to see which one of my guests was helping themselves when my back was turned. Next poker night, once everyone was gone, I pull up the video. There Joel was, plain as day, stuffing like $60 worth of medication into his pockets. I sent him the video and told him he had to return my medication or pay for it. And I told him that if he chose to do neither, he should no longer consider me a friend. He denied it. Even with the video staring him in the face, he said he hadn't taken anything. He even had the nerve to act offended by the fact that I accused him. So I decided to ruin his life. Over the years, he's told me a lot of things he didn't want his wife to know. Affairs, shady stuff he did with their joint funds, drug issues, terrible things he said about her, her mother, and her sister. I went back through all of our messages and took screenshots of everything secret he'd ever said to me. There were over 70 pictures. And, well, I sent his wife the screenshots. Here are some examples of the kind of stuff that was in those screenshots. He admitted to cheating on her with eight different women over the course of our friendship taking money they were saving for a car and using it to buy drugs, specifically Xanax and Perks. The fact that he was continuing to do drugs after he promised her he was clean and sober. Here are some of the things he said about her and her family. She's a vile, disgusting woman. And the reason they never have sex is that he can't stand the smell in between her folds. He also said he was pretty sure she was molesting her niece. He said that all of her friends only pretend to like her so they can buy oxys off her. Also, as I'm editing this, I just remembered that he said he wanted to get one of his side chicks pregnant because he'd always resented his wife for being infertile. Here are some things he said about her sister. Her sister is an insane harpy. Her sister abuses her kids. This is not true, by the way. He just said it. Her sister is faking her autoimmune disease for attention. And now about his wife's mum. Her mum is a fat, lazy cow who doesn't actually need to be in a wheelchair. She just likes not having to stand up or bathe herself. So she's malingering. There were more things, but that's what came to mind without me having to dig through the screenshots I sent. His wife obviously filed for divorce and reported him to the police for the drugs he had in their house. While he was doing his eight months in jail for the pot that he stole from me, his boss filled his position and he lost his job. His now ex-wife won't let him in the house. Now he lives in a car and showers at truck stops. I found out about the aftermath in parts. 
Some came from his ex-wife. She told me about the divorce, kicking him out and getting him arrested. Some came from a guy Joel and I used to both be friends with, who works at the place Joel used to work at. He told me about the job loss, car living and the truck stop thing. I'm actually still on good terms with his ex-wife. I even sent her some enchiladas the other day for Cinco de Mayo. I also sent the video to all of our mutual friends, so he lost 90% of his social circle. I cut that other 10% out of my own life since they want to associate with known thieves. Birds of a feather, I guess. I mean, to be completely honest, mate, I don't really know why you're friends with this guy in the first place because I think of all the bad things he's done, all the stuff that he's texted to you, the fact that, you know, he just seems like a horrible person in general. He openly admits to cheating on his wife, doing drugs, like abuses his wife and all her family. And you know what? Probably just talks a lot of rubbish about loads of people behind their backs. Why were you mates with this guy in the first place? I don't personally get it from reading this story, but maybe he had some other redeeming features that weren't included. I, I kind of doubt it. I guess my overall point is that you can't really be too surprised op that this guy did steal from you and didn't even admit to stealing when his face was on the camera of him stealing because of all this other stuff that you know about which just shows him to be a bad person clearly this guy is a terrible person i don't really think you should have been friends with him in the first place and yes obviously now the revenge is perfect but um a weird one even in the first place in my opinion don't cheat on your graduation lifeline so I, a 19-year-old male, and my now ex-girlfriend, who's 18, had been together for more than a year when this story took place. We were in the same class during middle school and high school, a two-year friendship eventually evolving into a relationship. You all know how it is. We were happily together, at least so I thought, since December 2019. I thought everything was great between us the whole time. Although recently, about March, I noticed her becoming very distant and barely writing first, dry texting, etc. I asked her multiple times if everything was okay and I gave her some space, but it continued for the next few months. I was naturally very upset as I'd been through hell and back together with her when she was going through depression and a really hard time at the end of 2020. It suddenly felt like all this time was wasted and worth nothing. I, as a naive high schooler, truly believed that she was the one. It was serious after all. We matched perfectly together. We spent about three full months crying together at night when she was going through a rough time. We had similar plans for the future, similar interests, and it seemed we were meant for each other. My girlfriend, let's call her Caroline, was studying to become a lawyer. So she was mostly into humanity subjects. I, on the other hand, am studying biochem, the medical school. I apologize if this is all confusing or different. We live in Europe. She was required to attend at least one science subject to graduate, physics, biology, chemistry, or psychology. Now, she always hated these subjects and just took them because they were necessary to graduate. She ended up picking chemistry, as I was a natural and tutored 9th and 10th graders chemistry in my free time, and I always helped her with her assignments and more. It started as me helping her before her exams and assignments so she could get a good pass grade. But after her rough time, it warped into me writing half of the assignments for her. In February, she started to do everything with me again though. We had online the whole time. Anyways, enough backstory. After noticing Caroline started to get distant and never properly answered my questions regarding her behavior, I wanted to see how far it would go. For one week, I didn't invite her, call her text her first and in a total of one week she called me three times twice to ask me about her assignment and once telling me how she felt insecure and bad look i'm not a horrible person i helped her out with her school stuff and i comforted her when she felt down me being the naive love is perfect love burke i am i just chalked it up to her feeling depressed again but feeling embarrassed about it i continued helping and comforting her for the next month until nothing changed and she never opened up. I was honestly doubting everything by then. Is it me? What am I doing wrong? Etc. I tried everything I could. Eventually, I asked her friends if something had happened, but they said she was the same as always towards them. So I knew then something was up, but I didn't know what it was yet. One day, when she came over to my place, it was only the second time she did that in March, usually she used to come at least twice a week, we were sitting in my room and talking while she was trying out Valorant. After this, she went to my kitchen to make herself something, and I heard a notification on her phone. Now, I'm usually not a snooper, but I had a quick look at her screen that lit up. I wouldn't be able to read the message or know who it was anyways. 
It was a Discord notification. I was very surprised by this. I knew for a fact that she didn't have Discord about a month ago. Plus, she only plays Minecraft once in a while. She never uses Discord or anything. So the next morning, I did some snooping. And sure enough, I found a whole other Instagram account of hers where she branded herself to be an aesthetic gamer girl. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It was just new to me. She'd never told me about any of this. I couldn't find any of her friends following her on that account either. Sure enough, she had her Discord username in her bio. Now, curious and to be honest, butthole me decided it would be a good idea to create a throwaway account and try and text her and see what she was all about. Now, before you all complain about me, I know I was being a butthole here. I was just curious. I mean, guys, put yourself in OP's position right here. You find your girlfriend on a completely brand new account. She's been shady for a while now, and maybe that's to do with her own issues, but maybe it's new. You know, she's been the same with her friends and very different around you. Would you try and, you know, understand her position by making a shady little throwaway account and messaging her on her new Instagram account? I'd be tempted. I'm not gonna lie, I would be, just to see what was going on, you know? So then, after texting her on my new account, we talked for a bit, until she became flirty. We played a few games of Bed Wars together, once again on a throwaway account I bought for $1. I kind of broke down and started questioning my sanity. I'd been with her all this time and through so much hardship, I couldn't believe she'd do this to me. Guys, I kind of guessed that they weren't using voice chat when they were playing Minecraft, otherwise it would probably be a little bit obvious. After the sadness came the anger. I just wanted to know how far she'd taken this. I found it hard to believe that she'd casually flirt with guys like this. After setting up my first recon mission plan, I found out more about her until I found out about her supposed boyfriend. At that point, I had a huge emotional breakdown and I felt as if I'd wasted so much time helping someone who would betray me like this. From her Instagram stories, I'd find out later they were sleeping with each other for a whole month by now. This was about when her behavior started to change initially. It's all adding up now. At this point, I started to hatch my revenge plan. I knew I wouldn't let her off the hook this easily. So I spent two weeks pulling all-nighters, making sure I had all my work done till the end of the year. Until graduation, that is. I spent all my remaining time creating fake chemistry textbook pages so I could make my pro revenge more believable. All of the information was wrong. I knew I had to give her a taste of her own medicine, betray her like she had me. For the remaining two months of the school year, I fed her all of this fake information and made sure she got all of her assignments wrong. I knew she wouldn't be able to tell anyone she was copying off me as our high school had a very, very, very strict rule for plagiarism as much as three small cheating attempts on small exams could get you expelled. So after letting the pot stew for those two painful, awful months, I let the poop hit the fan. As our teacher had to handle an outrageous amount of classes, she always checked our assignments late, often by two or three months all at once. I knew I could use this fact to my advantage. After my girlfriend submitted her final assignments that were worth a huge percentage of our final graduation grades, I told her I knew about her shenanigans that had still been going on for the three entire months at this point. I told her how she'd hurt me and how it would come back to haunt her. I made sure of that. She mostly brushed it off and acted as if I were the villain as I couldn't just leave her and that she was only friends with that guy. Although I told her something was going to happen, I never told her what it was going to be. Trust me, she never saw this coming. One week later, the end of year results rolled around. When we received our final grades, I was over the moon as I'd passed with flying colors. On the other hand, her not so much. Due to her final assignments and all quarter four work equaling an F, she called me crying and asking for help. She told me she wouldn't be able to graduate if she didn't receive at least a passing grade for this year. She told me our teacher gave her a final chance after telling her how disappointed she was. Caroline has two more months at school with an extra one-on-one online lessons with our saint of a teacher. Honestly, props go out to her. To be honest, I felt really bad for her and her situation, knowing very well that if she didn't work her butt off in those two months in a subject she hated, she'd have to repeat the last year without someone constantly helping her with her chem this time. That compassion though quickly went away and I told her I would help her, but only if she apologized and paid me my regular tutoring fees. Caroline went full on ballistic after that and screamed at me. 
How could I do this to her? I hung up and she called me a few seconds after, apologizing and agreeing to pay for my help. She now has two months of intense memorizing with her ex if she wants to graduate. Oh my God. And there we go, everyone. That is the end of that pro revenge story. I mean, it's only pro revenge. It's not the most insane revenge story that I've ever heard or told on this channel. But if you think about it, the ramifications on OP's ex-girlfriend could genuinely turn out to be nuclear. She was leeching off of his good work the entire year, probably even longer, let's be realistic, from the start of their relationship. Now she has to do a subject that she hates as long with the rest of her entire year and she has no help. So I think she could be in the mud and think about it. If she never graduates, if she never passes, her whole life could be in tatters just because she cheated on her boyfriend who was helping her so much not even just with assignments but in life in general when you're going through a period of depression you can lean on someone like that and you know talk to them about your problems and cry with them at night why then throw that all back in their face i don't understand it personally but hey she got her comeuppance and, and that is justice served let's be realistic I mean, ultimately, it was her fault in the first place for, you know, using her boyfriend, OP, for his good work. Because ultimately, you're never going to really achieve anything in life, even if it's just at school. If you're using other people's hard work and, you know, just cheating and copying. Yeah, you might get some results short term. And fair enough, she probably would have passed with OP's help. But what about the long term? You can't just go on living your life cheating and copying other people. So that's that's a negative thing. But the worst thing by a mile is, is the fact that you're cheating on this wonderful guy. I mean, he seems so nice. He's helping you out in so many ways. I'm so sorry, man. From a brother to a brother, I'm sorry that this happened to you. You don't deserve it. You deserve someone better because that is just disgusting. All the time, effort you've put in to get thrown back in your face like that for someone who wants to become a an Instagram baddie playing Minecraft with the lads, cheating on you with other Minecrafters. It's terrible. It really is. I'm sorry. Fate helped me get back at my brother. My brother is 23. We're twins. And he is so mean. He's constantly doing messed up stuff to me. I'm a 23 year old female, but the worst thing happened five years ago. I got my first boyfriend when I was 18 and a senior in high school. I know we were young, but I really, really loved him. We'd been dating for 10 months when my brother randomly decided for literally no reason at all to make up a story about how he caught me cheating and tell it to my boyfriend. He planned it all out. He came up with the details. He made it sound real. And because he's such a scarily good liar and a master manipulator, my boyfriend believed him. No matter what I said or did to prove it wasn't true, he believed my brother over me. My brother kept up with his act the entire time and refused to admit he was lying. At one point, I thought I'd finally gotten my boyfriend to believe me, but then he broke up with me a few months later and confessed it was because he was still convinced I cheated on him and he couldn't move past it. He said, The worst part is that you won't just tell me the truth. And not to sound dramatic, but that still haunts me. I want to cry every time I think about it. And I still miss him to this day. Also, I think it's important to note that my brother has never once apologized. He's so insanely mean that he just thinks it's funny. I even asked him once if he'd consider hitting my ex up and telling him the truth for my peace of mind. And he just laughed at me. I never got over what my brother did. And I always told myself I was going to do the exact same thing to him one day. He's dated several girls since high school, but he'd never been serious enough about any of them for me to consider tricking them. I knew it wouldn't hurt him like it hurt me if I just tricked one of his flings or something. But he finally got his first serious girlfriend last year. And after thinking about it for a long time, I decided I was going to do it. We live in different places now, so I had to do it all online. I used a different method than he did. I contacted his girlfriend, pretending to be the girl he'd been cheating with. I made up an elaborate detailed story like he did to me and even photoshopped proof and stuff. I made my story even more believable than he made his. And exactly like he did to me, I went as far as denying it even to him because I knew he might use my texts or calls to prove to his girlfriend that it wasn't true. He knew I was behind it though, solely because the girl I made up doesn't exist and there's no one else that would do it. But I kept denying it. His girlfriend wholeheartedly believed me and my brother kept calling and texting me, begging me to give it up, even though I still wouldn't admit it was me. He was manipulating me and arguing that it's different because I was younger when he did it to me and my relationship wasn't serious. But my relationship was serious. And like I said, I still miss my ex. My brother really, really messed me up. I have empathy though. 
he doesn't and i was starting to feel bad for his girlfriend because she's innocent i was kind of regretting everything and thinking that maybe i should just tell his girlfriend the truth for her sake not his but then his girlfriend asked me a question which led to her admitting that she's been suspicious of him for a long time So I pried a little bit and encouraged her to look through his phone She told me she couldn't because she didn't know the passcode and he wouldn't give her access to it I guessed the few passcodes I thought it could be and gave them to her under the guise of seeing it once But not being sure which one i'd seen that was kind of dumb But I couldn't think of anything else to say and she didn't question it She got in because it ended up being the same passcode he's had since 2012 when our dad got us iphones and made us use the same passcode What an idiot. Anyway, lo and behold, it turns out my brother actually cheated on her and my setup was the reason she found out. He's been talking to and hooking up with multiple girls for pretty much the entirety of their relationship. Insert a lot of exclamation marks right here. I'm not really sure how many that is. At least 25. That's a lot of exclaiming. Oh, wow. I can confirm it's actually 28 exclamation marks. Goodness me, I'm not surprised because he is a terrible person and cheating seems right up his alley, but I'm shocked at the same time. I literally can't believe things worked out this perfectly. It feels like a dream or something. The universe loves me. I hate to revel in his girlfriend's misery, but I was feeling guilty about her being collateral damage. So I feel like this is the best possible outcome. My lie ended up being the truth. Well, not exactly, but you know what I mean. So I didn't scar his girlfriend or leave her with permanent damage for no reason. All my interference did was speed up the process of the truth coming to light. In fact, my brother may have been able to hide his cheating forever if not for me. He probably would have just manipulated his girlfriend and or refused to give her phone access forever. Now, she hasn't broken up with him and I'm honestly not sure if she will. I don't know how relevant that is, but it attests to how manipulative he is. He screws people over all the time, but somehow always gets his way anyway. It's honestly infuriating and scary. Anyway, I'm still not going to admit to my brother that I'm behind it all because there's really no point. That would just get me in even deeper trouble. I got a comment on my original post. OP actually posted this story first on r slash relationship advice that said, deny till you die, baby. And that's exactly what I'm planning on doing. Overall, life's crazy. Now, as revenge goes, I think we can all agree here that that was so deserved and it couldn't have gone much better. I mean, doing the same exact thing to your brother that he did so horribly to you before, but this time it's actually uncovering that he is really cheating and it's outing him as a cheater and potentially saving his girlfriend loads of time and, you know, commitment because she's now realizing, oh wait, he's actually been cheating on me with loads of different girls throughout our relationship. That's incredible. Like, can revenge go any better than that? Not only was it deserved in the first place, but the repercussions are amazing. It's astonishing. Now moving on to our second story the great arby's avalanche in my high school years I had a typical high school job as a fast food worker at arby's most of the job was very easy and surprisingly fun Unless there was a real idiot manager that happened to be working that day Well, this is a story about revenge on a boss or manager Our store had a real gem female manager that was very out and open about her hating men. She was a lesbian, nothing wrong with that, and made it very clear to all males they absolutely did not matter to her. She gave females extra breaks, allowed them to be late, give them free food, etc. The males, on the other hand, were treated like actual piles of dog doo-doo. The manager would leave us alone during busy times and sit in her car. She would take an insane amount of smoke breaks and then whine and complain at us when she'd come back and things would be all backed up. Eventually, several months of her garbage attitude and clear hatred got the best of me. And one day I had enough and I hatched a plan. Arby's at that time used to take call ahead orders on large workplace or party orders. People would call in and say they needed X amount of sandwiches for a luncheon. These call in orders didn't need to be verified in any way anyone could call these in i heard a different manager one time explain to someone that if someone were to call in a 300 dollars order and ditch the order he'd probably get fired for allowing that much beef to get wasted the roast beef product at arby's is treated like gold one day i knew this manager was working with me and i executed my plan about halfway through the shift i used the bathroom and texted a friend that was willing to help me i simply texted him 
it's go time. My buddy then calls our store and puts in an order for 200 roast beef sandwiches, which at that time would be about 300 to 350 dollars. This didn't affect me whatsoever because I was on drive through that day and didn't need to make the food. My manager immediately gets fuming that she had to make all this food and starts the process. After about an hour, she gets finished and goes on a tirade about how stupid everyone at that store is. Over the next two hours, it was next to impossible for me to hold in my laughter as I could tell she was growing very angry and worried that the order was never getting picked up. I started noticing her making phone calls to other managers and upper management people about what the heck to do with 200 roast beef sandwiches. Eventually, it was time for me to clock out and go home, so I did. Over the next several times I worked there, I noticed I was not with this idiot manager anymore. In fact, I never saw her ever again. She either quit or was fired. I guess I'll never know. All right, first of all, great revenge. There is no need to be sexist in the workplace, especially if you're a manager and you're overseeing a lot of employees. How can you just blindly, you know, choose the females over the males and and give all the females like breaks and and free food and just disregard the males? Doesn't seem fair to me. Doesn't seem equal. Secondly, though, I have to say, and this is the main thing that I've taken away from that story. Is that actually the policy of Arby's? You don't have to verify a massive order like that. I'm pretty sure that makes zero sense because surely you'd have to put like a deposit down or a down payment or give some sort of verification because it's quite a large order you know 300 dollars worth of food and if that goes to waste as we've seen in the story um it's not going to be good for anyone really is it so uh, the fact that there was no way of like verifying that the order was actually made by a legit person not a prankster someone who actually was going to use and eat the food that's i'm not gonna lie a problem on arby's behalf do you not reckon though guys like it's a bit weird that arby's wouldn't have you know a policy in place to make sure that the the identification of the person buying that big stock was confirmed and that you know they weren't just scamming you or pranking you or getting their revenge on you do shady things fire my boss hide millions from your clients i don't think so this happened a while ago but it's still so fresh in my mind I left college with a business degree in one hand and no job in the other. And like so many colleges, the promises of alumni willing to give jobs to graduates could not have been further from the truth. So I had to seek out my start from the bottom. I found a good job in operations at a company. Now I can't say which without giving it away. I had a great boss who taught me pretty much everything I needed to know. Work was great and the money was good. I need to explain how the business worked so you can understand how my plan worked. The corporate office was in California and we were not. There are a lot of things that went on at this company and I can't get into all of them because it would just take away from the story. But let's just say they had a very Stratton Oakmont vibe when it came to sales. All right, guys. So the next paragraph is pretty long and detailed, but it is necessary to listen to and it'll be over quickly. Trust me, we'll move on with the story. I started out working in operations with some of the smaller clients, but with some help from my boss, I was able to climb the ladder rather quickly to the point of being over all the operations and order processing for the firm. We had a very large client, about 90% of the company's business. The way it worked was we had two sets of sale reps, TSRs and CSRs. TSRs were the heavy hitters who reached out to the other big businesses and tech firms to extend their warranties on a product. They made real good money. The CSRs were more of the mum and pop crowd and the inbound sales calls for those that wanted to extend their warranties. The reps were all given codes that associates the client files with theirs. So if someone did a renewal automatically, they'd get paid as it was their clients. Pretty sweet gig. The client hired the firm to be the middleman for their B2B as they handled all of their everyday clients. So for every $100 that came into our firm, 18% or $18 would be for the company and the rest would be sent to the clients with the warranties activated. Most of the clients paid by credit card or PO with a wire transfer, but there would also be a good amount of checks each week that would need to be processed. A little while after I started, the client check portion was now going to be overseen by one of the sales managers. It didn't really phase me because I was working on these smaller accounts. Since we were a publicly traded company, all the sales reps orders had to go to operations to be fulfilled. They weren't allowed to process them on their own. This is when things started going downhill. My boss at the time was given temporary access to the financials as they were hiring a new CFO and he had a background with it. 
We went to lunch like we had done plenty of times before, but he seemed different. When I asked him if something was wrong, he told me that something looked off with our biggest client for one of the accounts. He wanted to make sure before he said anything to the higher ups. While this was going on, I had been offered the chance to be our new compliance officer, which means I would need to make sure everything was on the up and up. Soon after, I come in to find out that my boss was just terminated for a multitude of reasons, all of which had to be untrue because he was a pretty well-liked guy with not just the company, but with our client base as well. As I log into my terminal, I see that before he left, he'd given me admin access to his files. Here is where things started to pop off. Remember those checks that the clients were sending in to renew their warranties? Well, we were cashing them, all right. Apparently, we just weren't adding those renewals to their products in the system. That would have triggered a payout to our clients, who, as you remember, would be getting 82% of that money. Instead, they were cashing the checks, keeping the money, and using the interest in the accounts. Yes, in the mid-2000s, banks actually paid interest to cover losses in their collections departments. It was wild to see that this was happening and something had to be done. So I hatched a plan. First things first, secure a new job because it won't be a fun place to work after this. Done. My previous boss knew of other companies that would scoop me up. I put in my notice and stated in my exit interview that I just couldn't be a part of what was happening, even though HR was in on this. But I 100% wanted it on the record. Next, get approval for overtime for all the operations crew to come in on a Saturday and double pay them. They arrive early Saturday, obviously not too thrilled as to why they are there. But when I explain that if they complete the task, not only do they get their overtime, but they get nice bonuses, they were much happier. They spent the entire day applying all of those checks dated back years to the client accounts. We're talking millions of dollars. When all the sales reps arrived Monday, they were shocked as heck. Not only did they meet their weekly goals before picking up the phones, they made their monthly and quarterly goals too, two weeks into the new quarter. Cheers, partying, yelling, screaming, celebrating, all except sales management. They went from being really excited to skeptical to confused to, oh no, in about two hours. They realized where it must have come from. Because not only did the company hit all these sales since it had been over a day, the client came into work Monday to see a very nice payday in their system as well. And like anyone would have questions and they said they're coming out to congratulate the team on such great numbers. So management started scrambling because they literally couldn't figure out how this had happened and all under my boss's old login. On my last day at work, I arrive and I'm in the lobby. I've got my box for the last of my things, etc. A guy walks up as he's waiting for the elevator with me and we strike up a conversation. He notices my box and jokes about getting fired and I just tell him I had a great opportunity come up. So I decided to leave before poop hits the fan. We laughed. He was a really nice down to earth guy. He realizes we're getting off on the same floor. He asks if I work for X. I say yes. He asks where. I tell him operations and he reveals that he is the CEO of our clients. Gulp. We go our separate ways. The client shows up and there is a big party. Afterwards, the client says that they would love to get a breakdown of where most of the sales came from so they can allocate more money to that department. The management says sure, but then made up a lie about how they can't share client payment info due to regulations, blah, blah, blah. Cue my exit from the company. Two weeks go by and I get a phone call from a number I don't recognize. So I let it go to voicemail. When I get off work, I checked it to find out it was the CEO of the client where I used to work. He has had something come up and would like to talk to me. Of course, I'm nervous as heck, but I call him back and he picks up on the first ring and we get to chatting for a bit. And he finally just asked me, why did you leave? I tell him I had a great opportunity come up. He doesn't buy it and says that apparently my comment about poop hitting the fan really stuck with him and he thinks something more is going on. So after a little more prodding from him, I tell him just look at collections and that's all I can say. He thanks me and I hung up. Two days later, he pulled the plug on the accounts. Apparently my old company tried to threaten him with a lawsuit for pulling the account three years earlier. He replied with, that's fine because I can show the court that I have the evidence that you committed fraud. Corporate came in and cleaned house. All of management was fired within the day. 
One month later, my friends and I had a very memorable trip in Vegas, all courtesy of our old clients. And there we go, guys. A little bit more of a technical pro revenge story to start off this video. I, I hope you all stuck with it because the, the revenge was definitely worth it. But yeah, a couple of those paragraphs are definitely very detailed. What I can't really understand here, and I'm trying to look through the comments and work it out, is, is first of all, how nobody noticed this beforehand. And second of all, how many people were in on this? Like how many people are actually committing the fraud? Was it just your old manager or was it, you know, like his team as well? Was it a number of people in on it or was it just one person that was benefiting? Clearly it's a lot of money. I mean, millions, but wow, for you to find that out and, and for your old boss as well to know that something was up and to give you his password and log into the computer database just before he got fired because he knew that he was off and that you would be the only one to save the universe. It turned into like a bit of an action movie. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I hope you guys did too. Now moving on to our second story of revenge. Revenge of the highway construction boss. First things first, this is a story that an old friend, co-worker of mine, told me years ago. This friend has since passed away, rest in peace Greg, so I'm unable to go back to him to get more details. Greg's family live near Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. Greg's dad was in construction, working as a job site foreman, and Calgary was going through an oil boom in the 1980s and new roads and highways needed to be built. The practice at the time, it probably still is, was to get expensive surveyors to lay out the path for the road at the start of the project, and the path was marked with wooden stakes in the ground. These roads were going through some of the grasslands on Calgary's outskirts, and good progress was being made on the road in question. Then one morning, the crew got to the job sites and found that all of the stakes had been knocked over. Calgary had, maybe still has, its fair share of yahoos and pickup trucks who like to cause trouble. So from the tire tracks, they figured that during the night, someone had found the job site, noticed the stakes, and decided it would be fun to drive over all of them. I suppose today's yahoos and pickups would be deterred by cheaper surveillance cameras, but this was 30 to 35 years ago. Greg's dad was fuming, but he had to call the surveyors back in to do the layout again before they could continue. A few nights later, the same thing happened again. They arrived at the site and found all of the stakes knocked out again. Another call to the surveyor's office later, they had the road mapped again. But Greg's dad had a plan this time. Construction sites can have a lot of rebar and other types of iron and other metals lying around. They also have lots of heavy equipment for applying force to things. After the stakes were mapped out for the third time, Greg's dad got a crew together to drive an eight foot long piece of iron vertically into the ground directly behind one of the stakes near the end of the road layout with the top of the iron in line with the top of the stake. Then he waited. This is going to be unbelievable. I want to know what happens right now. A small number of days later, he got to the job site and found a wrecked pickup truck in the field along the road's path. Its oil pan and other undercarriage components had been ripped off by the metal post that was protruding from the ground. They had signs all around the site indicating that unauthorized vehicles were prohibited, entering was at your own risk, etc. So they were covered from a legal standpoint. With the truck as evidence, they were able to find its owner and have him charged with trespassing, destruction of property, mischief, and anything else that they could make stick. All right, firstly, fantastic revenge, don't get me wrong. But the cynic in me is thinking that could have gone so much worse for the driver. Like, imagine that he dies. I don't know, maybe the truck, like, really has a, you know, a big collision, goes off to one side or something, and, and he literally somehow dies, the bloke. Greg's dad could then be in serious danger, could be facing murder charges. So while it was a great prank and something obviously had to be done, I'm not... <laughs> It's just risky, isn't it? I mean, fair enough. It worked out brilliantly. The guy was fine. I, I assume just got out of its van. The van was absolutely total and he just booked it, trying to get away with uh, with no evidence. But yeah, brilliant stuff. I mean, I don't really know why he was doing that in the first place. What sort of enjoyment do you get from just knocking over loads of stakes? I mean, maybe it's fun once, but you're ruining people's days. But wow. I mean, it's risky, but it's risk versus reward, isn't it? He could have died in 1% chance, man. Maybe 0.1% chance he dies, but 99.9% .9 chance you get some fantastic revenge and this guy gets the karma he deserves. And there we go. Really hope you did enjoy our slash pro revenge, the movie best of 2021 edition. There have been some great revenge stories that I've covered across this year. I think you guys will agree. And I hope that I've selected the very best to go in the video you've just watched. If you did enjoy it and you want to see our slash pro revenge, the movie part one, it's on screen right there. If you're for some reason not satisfied by this two hour long video of pewter revenge stories and you want more right away, 
there you go. If you are new to the channel, subscribe here for daily Reddit content, and I'll see you guys all tomorrow with a brand new video.